Good morning. It's difficult not to be sympathetic with Indian bands in British Columbia who feel that their children have been, quote, stolen, quote, kidnapped from them by the white man's social welfare and court system. 2,880 in the province of BC. Yesterday, the Indians, however, led by the Spalum Chin Band, marched in the most unusual foray to the house of the Honorable Grace McCarthy, the Minister of Human Resources. They knocked on the door. They did not get an answer. Not that Grace is unwilling to speak about it because she plans to be here momentarily. And also in the studio will be two representatives of the Indians of British Columbia. Already here is George Manuel, his, who is president of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. And on his way is Wayne Christian, who is leader of the Spalum Chin Band, which started this Indian child caravan to draw attention to what some of them, many of them apparently feel, is cultural genocide. Cultural genocide carried out by the courts, the welfare workers, and with the tacit consent, I suppose, uh, of the majority population of British Columbia. Also today, we're going to be dealing with that very touchy question of mandatory retirement. You gotta go, you gotta go at 65. And the complications that arrive there from if you don't gotta go or if you don't wanna go. And here to talk about that will be John Hepzog of Simon Fraser University who carried out a study on behalf of the Human Rights Commission of British Columbia, as a result of which the human rights people have recommended, broadly speaking, to their political bosses in Victoria that mandatory retirement be abolished. I'm not quite sure where I stand at the delicate age of 39 going on 63 in that particular field of human endeavor. Not for light relief, but for fascinating relief, you're going to explore the life of a man described as a deliberate stranger. Everybody in the Northwest knows him. His name was and still is E.J. Ted Bundy. He's sitting death row somewhere in Florida and here's what happened the day he was sentenced to death. It is further ordered that on such scheduled date that you be put to death by a current of electricity sufficient to cause your immediate death and such current of electricity shall continue to pass through your body until you are dead. It's a tragedy for this court to see such a total waste, I think, of humanity that I've experienced in this court. You're a bright young man. You made a good lawyer. I'd love to have you practice in front of me, but you went another way, partner. Bundy is believed to have killed 39 people. You're going to learn a lot about Bundy this morning through the eyes of a Seattle newspaper man called Larson who has written a book, you can only call it fascinating, called The Deliberate Stranger. There were a number of other topics I was going to tackle this morning as I wait for my guests to arrive, but I'll get back to them later in the week. One of them is the great outpouring of propaganda from the drug enforcement authorities in British Columbia, about whose actions I'm beginning to have severe doubts. I'm wondering whether or not we have built up a massive empire of interpreters, translators, combined police forces, and the Lord knows what not, which has in itself created an industry which may be part of the problem and not part of the solution. We'll come back to that perhaps later in the week. In one of these mornings, too, I must give you my best interpretation on this constitutional crisis. But first this morning, we're going to deal with the question of the Indian child caravan, and we're going to deal with it hopefully momentarily through three particular authorities, Grace McCarthy, George Manuel, and, if he makes it, Wayne Christian of the Spalamchin Indian child caravan after the break. With me now, I have the Honorable Grace McCarthy, who's good enough to make it by the skin of her teeth this morning. I only phoned you at what time? About 8.15 or eight, right. 10 past 8. And here is George Manuel of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. My first question <laughs> to you, Grace, is 
Were you home and why didn't you answer the door when they came to the door yesterday? Well, I wasn't home. Uh, our, there was no one at home. I was out for dinner at a family dinner and uh, I wasn't home and there, of course no one can answer the door when there's no one home. Do you feel it was unfair and a true invasion of your particular weekend domestic privacy for the caravan to come to your house? Well, unquestionably, uh, I do feel that way, especially since uh, I was not given any notice of their coming. I was not asked to meet with them. And you know, uh, as everyone else that gets to me knows, that if someone asks for an appointment, uh, I will make time to see them. And uh, I was not asked. And, uh, and uh, so from that point of view, I think it was an invasion so of privacy. In a, little and bit of a, in a little bit of a rightful snit about that. Oh, well, there are more things in life to get upset about than that. And so that doesn't upset me too much. <laughs> George, uh, perhaps Wayne Christian could answer the question better. Were you out at Gracie's house yesterday? No, I wasn't, uh, Jack. In the meantime, however, you fully support the Indian Child Caravan as the president of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. Yes, I officially went on record supporting. I have to support, and I do support, all bands who are members to the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, and the Splumchin Band is a member of the Union. Grace, is there, is there in your view, a shred of truth in cultural genocide carried out, but quite bluntly, by the white man, for sheer convenience sake? No, I think that's a, a, a true exaggeration. Uh, the results of um, Native Indian children being uh, raised in non-Indian homes, uh, unquestionably, if the band itself does not, uh, does not make a great attempt to uh, reach those children or the children in the band, unquestionably, they will take on the non-Indian way of life. Um, let me just say, though, very clearly, that we do not uh, rush in and apprehend children uh, unless there is a cause. And what, causes, what causes would there be child with abuse. Indians different from wild, mm -hmm. with white children? Child abuse, uh, child neglect, and um, we are, the federal government does all social services on, on the, uh, uh, within the bands. Uh, and they are responsible and they pay for it and they have their own staff. Uh, our people are only asked to contract for services where the protection of children and they contract with the uh, provincial government for uh, child protection services which we provide on contract for the federal government and remember we don't make the decision as to where a child will be uh, when a child will be taken into uh, care the judge makes the court makes that decision. Let me get that quite clear are you telling me that even in this day in 1980 the federal government is responsible for delivery of all social services to Indian bands. On the reserve. On the reserve. And you are responsible for carrying out the particular protection of children. That's correct. Uh, we're respon we have the Protection of Children Act is the responsibility of the provincial government. The federal government purchases the service from the Ministry of Human Resources uh, when it comes to child protection cases. So because of our expertise, our, our uh, ministry's expertise in that area, they purchase the, the service. And you plead not guilty? Well, certainly uh, we are not uh, guilty of some of the atrocious things that have been said about our ministry. And let me say this, my ministry does not go around picking up children because they're delighted to do so. Uh, my, my ministry has the protection of children under their responsibility. And let me ask how many television cameras and how many um, comments and how much um, uh, would come down on us from the public, including the Native Indians, if we neglected to do our duty in protecting a child in this province. Wayne Christians, Wayne Christian, the head of the Indian Child Caravan of the Spalam Chin Band has just arrived. Uh, Wayne, meet Grace McCarthy. Good morning. You weren't home yesterday. You didn't tell me you were coming. You should have known. You should have asked me for an appointment. I would have <laughs> gladly given you one. That, but you didn't wish that, I don't imagine. I think you wanted the confrontation and you wanted the publicity. And if you had asked for a meeting and had received one, I, no doubt you, you, it would have taken away from all of the publicity which you had wanted to generate. Is that not true? Possibly. What we want actually now is to meet with you after if we can out of over here because there's a lot of people with us, as you understand. It. Make your case in front of me too, Wayne, because I said off the top of the program this morning, it's very difficult not to be sympathetic with the Indian cause when children are removed and put into white foster homes, of which we now have how many, roughly speaking? 2,880, it said? 
the, approximately 39% of the children that are taken into care are Native Indian children. Of those 39%, 30% 30 are in, only are in Indian homes. The rest we do not have Indian homes for. We have pleaded with the Native Indian uh, councils and band councils and associations and they have not provided us with more. We continue to work towards that goal and we hope we can have that goal reached where it will be 100 percent. What do you want Grace McCarthy to do? She explained to me just now that the federal government, is, nobody's a, denying a problem admits, but what do you want her to do, the minister to do? Okay, what we're explaining, you know, in terms of the, the court case that we're bringing before the courts in the next couple of weeks is that we want jurisdiction in our, in our laws that we have in our community. Like what you're saying is that your department has protection of children under uh, Bill 45, now if I'm correct. And what we're saying under our Indian government laws that we have in our community is we want that jurisdiction. We want control of those dollars that you're receiving from Indian Affairs. That's what we're saying. We want those resources in our community so we can make the foster parent payments, so that we can develop our own child care programs, so we can hire chair, you know, and have our own group homes and those types of things. That's what we're saying. It's pretty simple in my mind. And what you're saying is that as a province, uh, you know, you, you provide a service, you know, because that's your jurisdiction under the Constitution. And what we're seeing in the Constitution, we're saying we have powers there that as an Indian band and as an Indian government that we want those, that legislation recognized. Are you being practical though? Is he being practical at all? Well, we have a problem here, and the problem is not that we do not wish to have uh, independence within the Native Indian people, nor, in fact, we would applaud that. We would want them to have independence, but we also have this problem, that if there is any child that is neglected and known to be neglected or abused in this province, we have a constitutional necessity to have the protection of children under the provincial government. Now, you speak, um, uh, Chief uh, Christian, of uh, the uh, court case, and I can't reflect on that court case, Jack. That is a forthcoming court case. It is not over. It Was is still there not a court us. case before, though, which made a point about the custody of Indi Indian children and non-Indian -in homes? That was a Supreme Court case, which was about the adoption of children, and would the Native child retain Native Indian rights after adoption? And the court ruled, yes, it would, and uh, what comes first is actually the Native Indian rights and then the adoption they retain the rights. I'm grateful for my panel hastily drawn together at the last moment. We'll give Wayne and George Manuel and Grace McCarthy a moment to get back and you can make the strongest points you wish What's after the break. Okay. Wayne Christian and George Manuel from Spalham Chain in the Union, and Grace McCarthy. Very There's quickly. Uh, three things I would like to clarify. There is definitely the, the, the f one of the fundamental problems here is that there is a, a cultural clash between the way the provincial government administers uh, the child care and the values of Indian people. Just to specifically cite an example, uh, about three or four weeks ago, a group of children was apprehended in Fort Ware and the purpose of the apprehension was that the, the grandparents who normally looks after the children were supposed to not have food in the house and it was luckily our lawyer was happened to be in the area and this has been the real problem and that, and that is Indians generally in Indian communities uh, cannot speak for themselves. There's usually not a representative around to speak for them. And in this case, our lawyer was there and uh, went to the old lady and the old lady showed them all the food that was in the house. And this was Indian food. And, it, and Indian food is the, is the very basis under which uh, the nourishment is acquired by Indian people. And this is the one cultural class. The other big problem that we're, of I course, just, faced just, with is the other, uh, we, we have a data from the Association of American in, uh, Corporate Affairs in the United States in which uh, a great number of Indian people are being adopted in the United, Canadian Indian people are being adopted in the United States. In 1975 alone, there was 300 Indians adopted into American Indian homes in Not the state from of BC. Not well, from BC. from BC as well. From Are you BC aware of that second point at all, Grace? No, I'm certainly not aware of that. I can't imagine part. a Canadian, a BC court the, adopting a, a foster child into a, an American home across the border. There'd be an instant outcry. This was uh, submitted before the uh, 
Committee on Immigration and Foreign Affairs in, in the United States. One second. This is where we I, I want to give everybody a fair chance. Do you want to touch this case of Fort Ware, which is some yes, I story? Do. I, I do, because it's the one case that uh, the group has been uh, talking about all weekend, and let me just make it very clear. This is where the dried moose meat was yes. regarded as rags, by, allegedly yeah. by some social yeah. worker. Now, now, on those grounds alone, on the grounds of the children not having sufficient to, to eat, uh, they would not be apprehended, they may be apprehended, but they certainly wouldn't be committed to another home. They would not be taken away from their natural parents. First of all, we don't make that judgment. The judge makes, the court makes that judgment. And the court would find out what reasonable grounds there would be to apprehend and to keep Why them Why is there a judge in that case? No, there wasn't a judge. The, the problem was resolved before, the, before it went before the judge. But we have another serious problem, and that is in other words, food was supplied. If well, uh, yeah, it was decided there was that there was enough food. Yeah. But let me get to, I want to get to this cultural genocide point. 25 years ago, 20 years ago, when housing in Indian reserves was very bad for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. Blame the white culture, whatever. You know, blame anybody you like. Do you suggest that there is, in fact, and I don't want to bully you, it, it, that there has been any kind of deliberate cultural genocide way, or is it just a... Well, if you analyze it and look at it, quite honestly, like in our community, we're just a little over 300 strong, and we have had 100 children taken from our community, and that's 30% of our population. For how, over how long? Okay, from 1951 to 1961, we had 70 children taken, or one generation, and we're suffering because of that now. Why were they taken? I have no idea. In Why a lot do of you cases, okay, like for instance, m myself, my mother, my mother, you know, she had us taken away from her. And uh, I still have not been able to find out why, because in my mind we were we were doing okay. Like How I was old only, were you? I was only 12 years old at the time. Where were was, you put? Uh, in far away foster homes around the area. Well, we can't speak about your specific case, but broadly speaking, when a hundred children are taken away from one band, hmm. in how many years? It's 51 been a 30, to 30 year period. What do you think the reasons were? I think a lot of the reasons, in, in terms of the there's a lot of difference in values because a lot of the, the children were taken when they were being taken care of by the grandparents and our parents are away working in the orchards. Without like talking that. about the Spalum Chin Band, can you give me the broad reason over all provincial administration, yours and previous ones, why these children would have been taken into care? Because they, for their own protection. Let me make it very clear. Our ministry does not go around uh, taking children out of anybody's home uh, because it's lots of fun. It's one of the most traumatic experiences for a member of our well, ministry to do. what would it be? Neglect? It would be neglect. It would be abuse. It would be a child that would be uh, so endangered that that child would uh, be close to death or whatever. There are so many reasons, and th those reasons are very clear well, in our in our. We would like ministry. to... Uh, do a study in relation to the cultural conflict between Indians and non-Indians and we have never been given an opportunity. The, the go federal government has made representations to the provincial government to allow Indian people to get involved as third parties into anything that, that has to do with Indian affairs and the provincial government uh, has refused the involvement of the Indian people. I myself has been fully involved in trying to, ne to negotiate this involvement and and uh, we haven't the, the provincial government's position on this is that uh, that yes mr manuel you, we let you get involved after the block funding is agreed upon by the yes. by the by us that, you know, Mr. Emanuel, uh, this is not true. Uh, we have not only had a cooperation, but it is demonstrated in the Stony Creek Indian Band uh, example, where two children from one family were taken from the family for their own protection. We worked with the community, the Native Indian Band, our own people of the Ministry of Human Resources, and we've been able to return those children in the past year to their own natural parents. The problem Let's go that, back to Wayne again, though. From How old are you, Wayne? 26. Do you, do you I just want to, just in terms of that Stony Creek example that the minister was just uh, reciting, and wouldn't you agree that the authority for that uh, committee lies with your ministry and not with the community? The authority I, it only lies within the as much uh, initiative that the, the band itself would like to take. And, but wouldn't, and you, also, been wouldn't you also agree that, uh, that, that that committee, if you with, withdrew from that committee, that that committee would be an operational? But you're going to lose the listeners on these technicalities. Yeah. I mean, that means nothing to the people out there, Indian and non-Indian, are watching. Let me ask you a question. Yes. Is the state of your band now such 
and other Indian bands in British Columbia that in your opinion you can cope with all domestic emergencies and that you can care for children who have been neglected, abused, or through, and it happens in white communities too. We've got lots of neglect, abuse, alcoholism, and brutality. That also happens in Indians. Can you now care for these children within your own housing and facilities? Yes, we can care for them. Like we've got families that are taking a lot of children, for instance. Like we've got one family that has seven foster children alone. And, uh, With the approval of Gracie's ministry, I presume. Well, some of them, some of them we do on our own. And uh, it's, really, uh, it's really evident that this is one of the problems we really do have is housing. But this year, we're putting into our community 13 units that we can uh, pick up some of the slack. Well, you would cooperate with that, wouldn't you, obviously? We have said right along that we would like to cooperate and we would like to have that. When I, I wonder, I Jack, the real problem here is the, is the authority, you know. I mean, the, there is, if the Human Resources Department, if the, if the Madam Minister, or her government, I should say, her government, along with the federal government, agreed to cooperate to support the Indian families, to support the, 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 the governing authorities in the community. We could handle that problem with no problem at all. After the break, we'll do one short segment. Wayne Christians, Palam Chin, George Manuel, Union of BC Indian Chiefs, Grace McCarthy, Minister of Human Resources. Is this really a political move, looking at the bad old days and now that things are improving? Are you on a straight militant political kick? Militant? No. Political, not, maybe. <laughs> what kind not, of politics? I mean, I'm not asking you for the name of a party. What do you want specifically Grace McCarthy to do, if she could do, when she tells me that it's the federal government that supplies the services and the she does care and protection of children. What do you want? What we're really saying is it's not only the politics of the thing, it's the reality of the thing, is that we want the responsibility for our children, and it's pretty simple. You know, you can interpret that as politics. Why, but didn't, also you, why didn't you put these Indian children, 2,880 at the moment, into Indian homes? Because there weren't in Native Indian homes accepting these children, and there is the problem. If we had, uh, if, if our white homes who have taken these children in, had not opened up their hearts to these children, we would have been uh, been discriminating against the Indians. That would have been the charge. You can't have it both ways. If you want to have uh, Native Indian children protected and taken away from places where they are uh, at danger, then provide us with the Native Indian homes and we would be delighted to have them. We've asked for that. We also have said that we will cooperate fully in any way that we can to make an in, uh, the, the opportunity and the chance for the native Indian child uh, as as good as it possibly can be in this province and we want to work with the native Indian bands we have offered that we've offered it and we have had that acceptance and it has worked in the Stony uh, Creek band example it has worked and the Stony Creek example is a poor example because the 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 employees working. there are directly responsible to the Mi Ministry of Human Resources but we're missing the point here altogether. So am the I. Po the, the, po the point is really the, the, there is no services, no provisions either from the federal government or the provincial government to, to, s to help the families who are, ha are faced with these problems. And we're trying to focus the attention on, we're trying to strengthen our identity, our cultural identity as a nation of people. Mm -hmm. And the only way that you can accomplish this kind of goal is by strengthening the family, and we know that. And so we're, the, there is no services provided, maybe under the new act, but certainly not in the past. Mm -hmm. There's no prov <coughs> the provision, to st no, no resources to help. It. It's just simply straightforward to apprehend the children when there is some kind of uh, abuse or some kind of neglect, that, uh, which is neglect to the non-Indian is very different than, than ours. For instance, putting an Indian child in a grandparent's home to us is neglect, and sometimes that's looked upon it by a social worker at the field level as neglect. Wayne, have your say. You know, I feel what George is saying is quite true because, uh, like, just quite recently in the past in our, in our community, we could not get services from human resources. I think at the time, uh, Bill Vanderzam was the minister, and he made a statement, I think it was October 78, that they would provide no services to Indian communities. 
and all the service that they do provide is the apprehension route, and that's all that they provide, period. Grace? Well, it is not a provincial government edict. It is a, it is a federal government uh, program. The federal government provides social services on the Indian reserves. The only time that we're called in to assist is in the protection of children. And then we only assist. The judge makes that decision. I would like to say that we are often called in by the Indian families themselves. It is not always because it is someone who is from the non-Indian community that says that an Indian child is being neglected or abused. We are called in by the Indian families themselves because they know there is a child being neglected and they want the protection for that child. Wayne, what do you say to that? I think in, in the case like our community, we start developing and having our own people working in our community, they can come see us, but they have no other alternative because like what you're saying is that child care rests with your ministry. And you're saying the federal, res federal government has responsibility through social services, but they transfer all of that to you in terms of the transfer payments. Would you not agree? Well, in terms of where we are going to, if we place a child, we pay for that child through the transfer payments. We pay for that child in that child's home, whether it be a non-Indian or an Indian home. It makes no difference. And there's no involvement of Indian people during the negotiations for those resources oh, between the federal so. government and the f no, I've, well, I've made me, every effort uh, to have... Let me uh, tell you that have, there can be as uh, much involvement as you wish and I Only have after the fact though, and your ministry are your officials in, the, in meeting with uh, your predecessor, in meeting with the officials, they've said it would no involvement until after we've negotiated and come to an agreement with the federal government on the kind of monies that we Okay, we're, lo we're losing this on yeah, question yeah. of transfer payments. Is there any easy answer, Wayne Christian? You brought this ban down, you've succeeded in your purpose quite properly of focusing on the number of Indian children and non-Indian homes. It's conceded that for a long while there weren't any Indian homes for some of these children and they had to be put in non-Indian homes. Are we all agreed on that I would like at to, one time? I would like to ask these gentlemen, are they prepared to, to help us uh, in an aggressive way, as aggressive as they've been in this uh, campaign this weekend, are they aggressively going to assist us in getting more Native Indian homes for these children? Would well, my response that? to that, would you be prepared to help us? You know, we have yes. our goals. This is where we, we, our conflict is. This is where your government refuses to cooperate with us. Would you be prepared, would you be, do your department be prepared to cooperate with us within the framework of our goal to develop self-determination on Indian reservations by helping us to provide services to our Indian governments rather than taking the children away from their families and also strengthening the families within the Indian communities through the terms of reference set down by the Band Council. Well, I have no idea what your terms of reference are, but what I would offer is the same kind of cooperation that we have offered before, and we'd be pleased to offer that, and we'd be pleased to work with you, and we have said that before. Are you prepared to take the $10 million, you apparently, your budget for this kind of thing, and give it to the Indian bands to spend? Oh, I, I couldn't make a blanket statement like that, and I'll tell you why. The Indian bands, and we all know, have had millions upon millions of dollars spent on them by, through the federal government, and they have not been able to have... Uh, the As much of that been wasted, that federal money? Well, has you, it been badly Jack, spent? You, Jack, yourself said before we started the program that there has been a tremendous progress in the past 10 years of Indian past people. Past 25 I think, years. Uh, uh, 25 years, okay. I think the resources that that the minister is talking about is related to that progress and development and we want to continue to escalate that kind of development that we're talking about. Last word from Wayne Christian for le who led the band and who achieved this spotlight on the problem which I think quite of all political partisan shape and size and Indians appreciate. Do you feel you've made any progress? I think we've made progress but like a what I'm going to say is that I think that it's time we left those problems behind and work towards the future. Like that's what you're saying, we work yes, together. Right. But what I'm saying with that is that $10 million, like I say, we want our share of that because we want to develop our own programs. And what I'm saying to everybody else is that, uh, you know, I think in my mind what we're trying to do is rebuild the family. And that was the whole intent. Our family was destroyed in the past. But can you blame the room. white man totally for all of this mess? Well, Jack, before... Yes, no, no. I'm asking the second generation, the young fella. Can you blame the white man totally? I would say yes. I would really say yes because I, in, in my experience with just my people and what, what they've gone through and uh, in terms of the dependency that's been created, you, like you said, they spend millions of dollars on our people. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that was spent in Indian affairs and the bureaucracy. 
So in my mind, it's time that we took control of those types of resources and rebuild our own communities. You can only do that democratically in our society, though, can't you? After negotiation and patient planning and talking to your federal government and getting your rights within the federal constitution, which is going to be thrust down our throats. I don't know if uh, Pierre Trudeau is an example of a democracy. I don't know if we can do anything. Grace McCarthy, thank you for coming here this morning. Perhaps you can, at least you've met now. First time you've I'm met Wayne. I'm very pleased that we've had the opportunity. You've met George before. Mm -hmm. I've yeah. done my best to try and stay in the middle and make it a little clearer. I'm grateful. Well, you've did a good job, Jack. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> my thanks to everyone involved. I'll be back after the break. <laughs> John Herzog is a young, tenured doctor professor type from SFU. In what particular field? Business administration. How old are you, Mr. Herzog? 49. 49. What's your pension? When do you have to retire? Uh, 65, I lose tenure, but I don't plan to retire ever. Uh, what kind of pension plan do you have? Generous one, being a university person. It's, it's fairly generous. You can live on it. Is it indexed? No. It's not indexed? No. Are you sure it's not indexed? Well, we, we have several plans at SFU. Some of them are marginally indexed to 3% per annum, but that's not very much. No, but you're not like the teachers gar guaranteed 8 or the BCGEU guaranteed the actual CPI increase? No. You're not? No. But you have a lovely job as a university professor and only teach six hours a week. Oh, yes. I retired when I was 28 years old when I went to the <laughs> university. <laughs> Our Mr. Herzog was commissioned by the Human Rights Commission to look into the problem of mandatory retirement. And I uh, think as a result of his submissions and the public hearings on the subject that the Human Rights Commission has recommended, broadly speaking, tell me broadly speaking what they've recommended to the legislature through the Attorney General. Well, most simply, they've recommended that any age discrimination in employment be banned. And therefore, they have recommended the ban of mandatory retirement. You in total sympathy? Yes, I am. I, um, I changed my mind in the course of the study. Why? I, well, because of what I found out in doing the study. Uh, I realized when I began the study that it was a very complex issue and that human rights was only one facet of that complex issue. But uh, during the course of the investigation, I became convinced that a lot of the arguments that had been raised against banning mandatory retirement really could not stand up to the test of merit. Such as the chronic age should not be the criterion for individual capability. Chronological age. Well, there, I didn't investigate uh, the aging process myself, but a lot of other studies have shown that chronological age uh, and a person's abilities are not very closely related at all. Well, you're going to have to, somebody's going to have to brainwash me because I have the feeling that mandatory retirement is to many people in those dull, gray industrial jobs. If they have an adequate pension, if they're lucky enough to be pampered civil servants, is a godsend and a blessing. Well, retirement for Compulsory some... Compulsory retirement is a godsend why, and a blessing. Why compulsory? Because they can get the hell out and draw their index pension and go play golf. But why not, why not make it attractive for them to retire? I'm not, I'm not opposed to retiring. I, I'm opposed to forcing a person to retire when he doesn't want to retire and when his employer doesn't want to lose him. What about the place at the lower end of the industrial complex or office complex for the young guy coming up? Are we going to uh, smother industry with a bunch of people who are slightly past their best beyond 60 but not capable of being fired for cause? Well, I can't answer that for the future, I, but on the basis of the evidence that we have today, it does not appear that that's a serious problem at all. Do you realize that in the whole of Canada, with a workforce of nearly 12 million people, if we were to, ab to abolish mandatory retirement immediately, next year we would probably add somewhere between 12 and 20,000 people to the Canadian workforce. Does well, it's a pittance. I didn't realize that. Does everybody die the moment they retire? No, it's that 
many people retire long before they reach the mandatory age. They retire either because they're tired out, worn out, and have adequate pensions and just don't want to stay around. They retire because they become ill or disabled and find that uh, they have sufficient income to survive on and uh, they're, they're looked after and so they don't stay So if on. there was no compulsory re mandatory retirement, therefore it would only add 12,000 people in the whole, of country, the whole of the country to the labor force. Those are the studies, uh, those are the statistics that have been developed in other studies done by the Economic Council of Canada, a reputable organization, and by the Conference Board in Canada, that shoots, another reputable research organization. That shoots down my simplistic argument that it would cause a lack of promotion for young people across the nation. Oh yes, and I, I think there's something else that we tend to overlook. This country creates jobs at an enormous rate. Uh, uh, we don't have a static job slot population. We c we're creating new jobs all the time. Is there a law about retirement in Canada or in BC? There's no law as such, is there? That's w that says you must retire yeah. at a certain age? Well, in a sense there is. The Public Schools Act, for example, which says the teachers must retire at 65. That's in the Public Schools Act. When, whenever you have provincial government employees or federal government employees, the terms of their employment are very often governed by a law. Policemen, firemen, firemen people of this kind. Oh, is it firemen at 60? I think they have a younger retiring age. Well, it varies from municipality to municipality, but somewhere between 55 and 60. And that's where they're taking an average of physical fitness over the years, I suppose, and saying we have found that firemen beyond the age of 60 are not capable of the heat and burden of the day. There, there are far more direct tests than one, that one can apply to that question without having resort to an arbitrary age limit. It was interesting in a meeting the other day, Jack Monroe was saying that they had a logger out in the woods, a faller, 83 years old, 83 years old. And he said, the guy was doing a fantastic job. Now, are you going to tell me that being a fireman is more strenuous than being a faller? No, it couldn't possibly be, could it? No, I don't think not so. To carry a no, I'm not chainsaw. saying that everybody is in great physical shape at age 83, but All right. there are exceptions. Let's talk about pension plans and what flexible retirement might do to them and the planning for them after the break. Well, your public hearings uh, illuminated a few things, but first to John Herzog, who did the study for the Human Rights Commission. 
What's the score in the states on this kind of thing? Well, the states abolished mandatory retirement effective January 1st, 1980 uh, in the federal service. And uh, they raised the age to 70 for all employers with more than 20 employees outside the federal service. But many individual states have abolished it altogether, like California, which is as large in population as the whole of Canada. They have abolished mandatory retirement altogether. With no noticeable social effects on the system. I don't. Would it so, be? Some people would say the country is falling apart, well, but I'm not sure it's mandatory they've, retirement. They've, they've got an old age pensioner of 69 who's not that bright running for president and liable to, <laughs> liable to be elected. <laughs> Well, I, th I think that proves a point, that we somehow uh, feel that our political leaders, uh, as long as they display vigor and um, uh, appear uh -uh. to be relatively sharp, can go well beyond 65. I mean, Trudeau's young at 63 and Clark's old at 40, 40 what? 40 what? How old is Joe Clark? About 42. I'm not asking you to comment on that. <laughs> What about, what would happen, however, to pension plans if you give this flexibility to retirement? Would that be an added drain or a lesser strain on them? Well, I think you raise an important point with pension plans. Uh, I don't really know the answer to that. Uh, there are many people who oppose the abolition of mandatory retirement because they think that if you take mandatory retirement away, then people will be forced to work beyond age 65 out of necessity, that their pension plans will be allowed to deteriorate and they will have to keep working in order to survive. But people who feel that you should be abolishing mandatory retirement take the counter argument. They say, look, uh, you're worried about getting dead wood out of the workforce, people retiring when they're 55 and then you keep them on for another 10 years. Uh, can, it's a big welfare scheme. If you want to get rid of those people, if you can only dismiss them for cause or have them leave voluntarily, sweeten up the pot, pay them better pensions. And if you pay them adequate pensions, they won't have any incentive to keep working. So you can make the argument both ways. You can say the abolition of mandatory retirement could lead to improved pensions, or you can say that it will lead to worsening pensions. You can't really know until the you The trouble try. is we've got an, uh, such an, uh, and I'm not nagging too much, such an unequal level of pensions across the board. I mean, I'm not joking when I say that fully, in, uh, fully indexed for some lucky government employees, and Shell Oil, I think, is the only big firm that does it otherwise, the small employer with no pension plans, the guy is driven to work because he can't live on his pension. Am I not correct? Oh, absolutely. Uh, but you see, many people have inadequate pensions who are now subject to mandatory retirement. It, yeah. it, it is not necessarily true. How did we come to 65 as the kind of generally accepted arbitrary age? Well, that has a, that has a very long history. Uh, people put it down to Bismarck in uh, the late 1800s in his social legislation in Germany. The, while you can trace the roots back there, what Bismarck did was establish an age at which a social pension would begin, not mandatory retirement. And actually, he established that age well above the age at which most people ceased to live. <laughs> they, they were all dead, or most of them were dead. And uh, That's right. Bismarck, of course, was the guy who kind of was responsible for the creation of the German social system, which was... That's very right. strong before the end of the century. Oh yes, and even today uh, I'm amazed to see that the West Germans have, to my mind, the most progressive attitude toward uh, their senior citizens of any country on the continent. So when old Bismarck said it at 65, he knew he was, wasn't going to have to pay out too much anyway because the expectation of life probably for the industrial workers in those days would be in the late 50s, at the, at the oldest. Yes. Yes, I think that's a, that's a lot of it. But on the other hand, you must remember, for those few who did sur survive, it became a very important source of income. Quite fascinating, actually. The labor scene, the labor views seem to be split in BC. Monroe, as you say, doesn't want to stop this old faller of 83 working, but was there not some opposite views expressed by unions in front of the commission? Well, the BCGEU, the Government Employees Union, clearly took an opposite view. 
they felt that um, we should not be working on the mandatory retirement question at all, but rather we should be bettering the lots of the workers, uh, and that if we were to abolish mandatory retirement, we would weaken the union's bargaining position. Now, I, uh, I think uh, that is their view. The B.C. Fed, uh, many people think oppose mandatory retirement. Jack Monroe said they did not. There appears to be some doubt as to whether they do or don't. I read their brief, and um, they do want to see mandatory retirement linked with other things, but I, why not? That gives them stronger negotiating leverage. I mean, if you divide the package up and deal with this one issue, you kind of weaken your hand. Uh, you submitted your report um, to the Human Rights Commission. Their recommendation was quite straightforward, or is it complex? Well, it's quite straightforward in the sense that they said uh, we should remove the upper age limit for protection under the Human Rights Code. Right now, there is a, what's called a protected age group between 45 and 65, where you may not discriminate on the basis of age and employment. So they said abolish the upper limit altogether. They define age in the act as 45 to 65. They say remove that upper limit and move the lower limit down to the age of majority. 21. 19 in this Oh, province. sorry. More with John Hetzog after the break. With John Herzog on mandatory retirement, a couple of points. One, why is the discrimination, anti-discrimination between 45 and 65 in the present law? Just because of social attitudes to people over 45 who had no pension of their own? Well, I think it's, uh, it's largely a question of playing copycat. Um, the law in the United States was the first law in uh, North America covering age discrimination in employment. And um, in that legislation, uh, they put in a lower age limit of 45 and an upper age limit of 65 because most firms practiced mandatory retirement and uh, they didn't want to interfere with that process too suddenly. And they found that most age discrimination in employment did not begin before age 45. Yeah, even and, I can remember the days when you couldn't get a job because they said, oh, you're too old to go into our pension plan. That's right. That's right. And they used that as a cop-out. You see, it's, it's a fact that you can take a job uh, in an organization that has a pension plan and not be a member of their pension plan. They just used it as a cop-out, as a cover-up. You didn't have to go into Do the Do you suggest plan. that everyone should be pensionable in every occupation, though? Well, I, th I think that people ought to accumulate savings through something like a pension plan in such a way that when they reach uh, their golden years, they, they have the means to retire, and to the extent that we can make transfer payments to them through things like CPP and QPP, uh, I think we should be doing that as well as a, as a matter of social conscience. Right now, though, my terms of my pension depend entirely on the dictates or negotiations with my employer. Is that correct? Well, if you're represented by uh, some collective bargaining agent, a trade union, uh, yes, individuals can't really negotiate their own pension terms. Would there be any, any people in the country now who wouldn't collect their full pension until they were 70? Oh, yes, I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are. So therefore, the answer, putting it simply, is what? Flexible retirement? That's, that's really what the abolition of mandatory retirement says. It doesn't say you must keep working after 65. You can retire earlier. If you, you can have uh, a oh, pension plan. Oh, I can retire plan. at 50 if I want to. Of course. Whatever. You, you can have terms written into your pension plan that says, look, you work for this organization for 30 years and you retire on full pension. You start working for the organization when you're 20 years old, and you retire at 50. Like a Mountie starts at 18, retires at 45, and gets at 48, and gets another well-paid job. Of course. On the BC ferries or something. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I can't resist that. Is there a court ruling? Is there not a court ruling in British Columbia 
that it was wrong to fire at 65 on a pension? Shalefta? What was that case? Uh, the, the, the Shaflita case. Shaflita. That, that's the one that uh, the IWA took all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada. Only the Supreme Court refused to hear it. But there, there was... Because it had been ruled that they could force him to retire at 65. Well, they said that there was no error in the appeal court decision. Which reversed uh, the Supreme Court. Well, the, the appeal court had said that as long as uh, uh, the Human Rights Code does not protect people over 65, and as long as retirement, mandatory retirement, is practiced without discrimination among employees, they're all subject to the same rule, then there is no violation of the law. There's no discriminatory action. If your recommendations are accepted by the government, it would banish compulsory retirement in all areas or it'd still be subject to pension plan? Well, all areas of provincial jurisdiction. Uh, th this is a provincial government. Uh, this country can never do person. one thing at one time, can it? Like the Indians this morning, federal, provincial. Here we go again, federal, provincial. Well, Jack, as you may know, the Kroll Committee of the Canadian Senate Senator. Uh, has already recommended to the Canadian Parliament that mandatory re retirement be abolished. But that's in the federal jurisdiction. They, they cannot uh, pass the law over, over provincial Who knows, it might be in, no, it's not in the new Bill of Rights that Trudeau wants to pass, is it? Uh, I, there's not much in that new Bill well, of Rights. Well, you're not going to retire, you're going to stay till you're 65 and beyond. That's your plan, God willing. Eh? Oh, yes. My yes. thanks to John Herzog very enlightening commissioner of mandatory retirement in British Columbia. Next, Richard Larson, author of Ted Bundy, The Deliberate Stranger, after the break. Sitting in death row, in a federal prison in Florida in the United States is a man whose possible presence in British Columbia and certain presence in Washington State caused many nervous people to lock their doors at night and be very careful what they did. His name, Ted Bundy. With me today, Richard Larson of the Seattle Times, who has written, and I have read it, a fascinating book called, about Bundy, called The Deliberate Stranger. And I think, Richard, you should tell me right off the top, before we go into any of the gruesome details, <laughs> what made you pick the title The Deliberate Stranger? During the period of time that you were just referring to in Washington State, where a number of girls had disappeared almost one a month, sometimes more frequently than that, the panic had occurred and police began investigating, police in different jurisdictions. The girls were all beautiful, they all looked somewhat alike, they were all gone, there was no evidence of whatever happened to them. So the police did the usual police thing, and that is to check out all the girls, all their friends, members of the family, classmates, everybody they'd ever known, to see if they couldn't find that person who knew the victim, who might have known the other victims. They ran a computer check, uh, tens of thousands of names crisscrossing from all these cases. They found no pattern they finally concluded that the killer, the abductor killer, was choosing his victims on the basis of the fact that, that uh, they were strangers to them and he a stranger to them, so that there was no pattern. He was deliberate in being a stranger. The message I get from your book is if you're a psychotic of some kind who wants to do a killing, pick a stranger deliberately, no matter how repeatedly you, you use a device and you've got a 90% chance of getting away with it. Well, of course, yes, that's, that's correct. It's not my job, and it's certainly not my earnest wish, is to write a handbook for murder. But indeed, that is the way that this pattern unfolded, and it became, became, for the killer, a fairly successful pattern. It baffled police for a long, long time. How many people did Bundy, how many girls did Bundy kill? The FBI, at this moment, uh, categorizes a total of six, or excuse me, 39, as being uh, potential uh, victims of Ted Bundy. Uh, that being the case, according to the FBI, he would be the most prolific, as they phrase it, the most prolific mass murder in, in American history. When did he start out on the rampage? What year was that in Seattle, Washington, when we first heard of this uh, 
homicidal maniac who attacked, cut up, and killed these women. The one first case that was involved that became associated with the others was in January of 1974. Mm -hmm. And the others followed at uh, several day intervals, for anywhere from 20 days to perhaps 34 days or something like that. It was a fairly regular pattern of a girl disappearing, and each time in a different place, a different police jurisdiction. Again, a rather deliberate pattern, it seemed to police, to change from one jurisdiction to another so that you don't have just the Seattle Police Department or the Kittitas County Police Department or one jurisdiction having more than one. Anyway, in the early part of 74, he did maybe half a dozen killings? More than that, probably in the order of eight. Probably. Um, and he was suspected, was he not, at one time, or investigated for a couple of similar mystery disappearances in the interior of BC? That's correct. Uh, interior British Columbia had some disappearing girls, some homicides uh, in the early 1970s. And the, the provincial officials were very interested in Mr. Bundy. They were also interested in the pattern of crimes in Washington State, which, of course, were neighbors. And so on two or three different occasions, BC law enforcement officers did confer with our stateside law enforcer, enforcement officers to check out Mr. Bundy. Uh, in, in some of those instances, it was found and proven rather conclusively that he was elsewhere at the time of the commission of a crime in BC. So those are now rather ruled out. Am I right in your book that there was a one common, two common patterns which you talk about? One, they were all young, good-looking university students. Or high school girls. They were young and pretty, and they frequently looked alike. Well, the one, oh, first of all, Washington State. And then he next appeared without anybody knowing who he was and which states. His pattern was this way. Uh, he resided in, in Washington State, in the Seattle area, uh, through the early months of 1974. Then he enrolled at the University of Utah and became a student in the law school at Salt Lake City at the University of Utah. There then began a series of similar disappearances and homicides of girls in Utah and in neighboring Colorado. And uh, there again, the time pattern, the time sequence was remarkably similar to the time sequence of the cases in Washington State. And That's the same Volkswagen figure through all of the... Yes. The Volkswagen, uh, I'll amplify, uh, the most shocking of the crimes in Washington State occurred on a very hot July day in 1974. Yeah, one of those beautiful, gleaming days that we occasionally get in the Puget Sound area down there. A crowd of 40,000 people had gone to a state park around a, a beach, a lake. Enormous jam of uh, beautiful young people. One girl disappeared late in the morning from that crowd of 40,000. Another girl disappeared in the middle to late afternoon out of that crowd of 40,000. Uh, police afterwards, when they learned of the shocking uh, vanishing of the two girls, tried to put it together, they interviewed witnesses, and they discovered that several girls had been approached by a young man who identified himself as Ted. He was soliciting their help to unload a boat from his car in the parking lot. One girl went as far as the parking lot with him and saw that he had a tan Volkswagen. So at that point in time, in July of 1974, the police had their first real hunch. And she and turned back that girl. She turned she back. She said her husband was coming to get her. That's right. You're exactly right. And uh, she was wary of the situation. But, here we have but Ted and a Volkswagen. So that when he was arrested finally and began being examined as a suspect in Utah, Ted and a Volkswagen suddenly click, 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 police started putting together. I, I get the picture, and it's quite fascinating, that he used the same device on almost every occasion. He needed help. He had a cast on his arm. He needed help with his boots. He was a handsome, good-looking young man, and he was a personal friend of yours. Yes. Confess. Definitely. Tell us. Well, Ted, uh, let me confess fully. <laughs> uh, I'm a political writer, and my job is to cover political campaigns. On the Seattle Times. In Washington State, and in 1972, our governor, uh, Dan Evans at the time, a very admired liberal Republican, was seeking his third term. Among those working in his campaign was Ted Bundy, and he was working at a very high level as a personal advisor to the governor, and he was around the governor. We got acquainted, and I was frankly very envious. This is a good-looking young man. He had long, beautiful, wavy hair, uh, well-educated, well-spoken. Uh, uh, girls pursued him. He was a very uh, coveted young man. Going to be a lawyer, obviously a man of enormous potential. Charm. And any middle-aged guy like you and I might be somewhat envious of a yeah, bright yeah. young man like that. And so he caught my eye. I did an article about him. Uh, I kept... I 
try to stay in touch with him because I considered he was an up-and-coming political figure. He was certainly an up-and-coming figure. Well, he was certainly going to make news for yeah. certain. Uh, we didn't know exactly then what kind of news. Did you suspect at all in your dealings with him? You'd met with him later in prisons. Correct. And interviewed him. Correct. In the course of your work and presumably Correct. your newspaper work too. I held a dilemma in my heart and in my mind, as did an awful lot of people who knew Ted beforehand. He was such an appealing man, such a gifted young man, so totally socially skilled. Uh, there was no suggestion whatsoever. It could possibly be on the other side. In of other the words, I so could. Uh, go on. It was hard, hard to reconcile that with the fact that he was Ted. He drove the Volkswagen. He never had an alibi for any of the crimes, and there were a lot of circumstantial things pointing toward him. It was a tough decision to make. You could look at me now, and I might be a dreadful, paranoid killer. And because of your experience with Bundy, you couldn't go on a hunch. I am a newsman, uh, I like to be objective, I like to gather my facts, I'm very, very slow to rush to judgment on anything, and I was slow to rush to judgment on Ted. I must say that as evidence circumstantially stacked up over a period of time, I had to, I had to cave in to the inevitable conclusion. Dick Larson, Richard Larson, his book The Delightful Stranger, about Ted Bundy, now in the death cell. Where did you say, Rayford? Rayford, Florida. But I want to ask uh, uh, Richard Larson next, how badly the police bungled obvious clues and hints, and if there was poetic justice in the way that, uh, what's his name, Bundy, was finally nailed by the Florida courts, not known for their generosity, after the break. <laughs> Why did it take the authorities in the United States, in Florida, Colorado, Utah, and Washington State, four years, four years, wasn't it? Well, to nail uh, Ted Bundy, the, the centerpiece, the horrifying centerpiece, although it's not a gruesome book. You do not write, I must give you credit, you do not write the book in a gruesome, deliberately sensational fashion. I appreciate that. You'll accept that little compliment. I had come to know <clears throat> in my research the families of many of the murdered girls uh, I was able, I think, to suggest the pain and suffering without going into the details, the physical details of what happened to the girls in, over, in excess. What I was going to ask you was, I remember one particular story, incident in your book, where you point out that the public went to many lengths to attempt to help, help the police, but on at least one occasion, involving a cache of clothes, the evidence was never obtained by the police, nor yes. any leads given from it. Tell it, that story. It, it was an example. What I want to know is, did the police botch it, or did the, the final analysis do a good job? Oh, the answer is yes and no. Some police jurisdictions, some individual officers worked day and night, worked their hearts out, and were terrific. Who was the guy from Seattle? Well, a guy named Bob Keppel, particularly, yeah. is an outstanding detective down there. And uh, to this day, I think he still has this, every, all these cases still in his heart, because they're not, they're not yet prosecuted or fully solved his satisfaction. But unfortunately, it was, it was his jurisdiction, which there, it's a large jurisdiction. It's, it's the county uh, law enforcement agency around Seattle. And uh, the administration of it was not conducted very well. We give them some credit. They were pleading to the public for help. They were getting literally thousands of telephone calls, literally hundreds and, and then eventually thousands of names of people who were turned in as suspects in that massive flood with the switchboards clogged and so forth, occasionally the caller would give information and it was lost. The, the example that you're mentioning involved a man who lived in the mountainside west of Seattle, who with his son one day out on the mountainside had discovered a cache of women's clothing, apparently secreted, including, then there was another package that included bras and panties. He thought there might be something there because he'd heard about the missing girls. He attempted to give his information to the police after telling his son and others to leave that stuff where it is. It was left on the mountainside. He tried unsuccessfully for weeks and months to get somebody's attention. Nobody would come out. Finally, the rains and snows came, and over a course of time, uh, that material was lost, buried, and uh, Could have or otherwise useless for uh, evidentiary identification. purposes. Could yeah. have helped to identify and release the anguish of the parents whose children were well, missing. Well, it, it could well have, in fact, have, have done just that. We don't know. Much of it's lost. Mm -hmm. uh, I did eventually get up there, and he and I together dug and brought up a few uh, scraps of fabric, but it was so far gone that it was unidentifiable now. 
Bundy was first arrested when? He was arrested in uh, 1975 in? in Utah, near Salt Lake City. He was driving a tan Volkswagen. When they stopped him, they stopped him for a routine traffic offense. He was driving in a strange way in a neighborhood. They found suspicious things in his car. Uh, a pantyhose mask with some eyes cut out. Uh, a crowbar, uh, the, or a, a lead pipe of sorts. Uh, some strips of cloth that could be used as ligatures, uh, an ice pick, uh, altogether a rather strange <coughs> accumulation of stuff, and that's when they started looking at Where was him. that? Which state was that in? In Utah. In Utah. Did they suspect him of the Bundy murders? No. In fact, they didn't suspect him of anything initially, even though that they had some crimes in Utah. Another th item found in his car were a piece, pair of handcuffs, also rather suspicious. At first they thought he, they had a burglar, and so they had the burglary detail kind of checking him out. Meanwhile, the homicide people are attempting, homicide and assault people are looking for a guy who has tried to use handcuffs in attempting to kidnap a girl a few months earlier. When those two, when two cops finally came together and talked, burglar detail, a homicide detail, suddenly handcuffs, bang, Volkswagen, because the girl remembered the guy with the Volkswagen, suddenly it all happened and it all started going together. Was he charged with murder then? No, he's charged with attempted murder. Now that instance was the girl in which he had attempted to pick her up from a shopping mall, got her to his Volkswagen, tried to handcuff her, and then tried to hit her with his crowbar. She screamed, leaped out, fled. She was the one survivor. That you know of? The one survivor that we know of. Okay. Um, he escaped how many? He well, starts in 74, he first arrested in 75, they nail right. him in Florida in 78, right. Right. but he escaped twice between. Well, let me give you the chronology because he was eventually convicted in Utah of kidnapping that girl. Was, went to the Utah penitentiary. Meanwhile, they were developing a case on him in Colorado, the murder of a girl at a ski resort, a murder which occurred during the time that he was roaming in Utah and Colorado. He was extradited from the prison in Utah to custody in Colorado, where he was being tried for murder. In uh, June of 1977, of all things, he leaped out of the courthouse window at Aspen and made his way to freedom in the mountains, uh, the Rocky Mountains. He was at large for almost a week before he was recaptured, put into tight security. But he's a very beguiling person. The guards like him police like him, attorneys like him, you would like him, uh, anyone encountering Tend would, would like him, he's an amiable fellow. The guards got a little bit slack, a little bit loose, so at the end of 1977, uh, they eased off on the security and he escaped from the jail. During a court appearance. When they the first one was the court appearance, the second one was late at night during the holiday season, it was during the Christmas New Year holiday. Away again. He's gone, this time he was really gone. And that was the time he went to Florida? Correct. The, his behavior in Florida was he was getting sloppy then, wasn't it? That's a good, observe, good, good observation. Yes, he was getting sloppy. Not to be mad as a hatter. Uh, the diagnosis is that he was not insane. He's not certifiably insane. Um, he has been diagnosed as a sociopath, and that is one who possesses antisocial behaviors. But he's <laughs> different. He's not psychotic in that, in that he has full recollection of events. We know that. Uh, he has a full understanding of uh, what he's doing. Um, he has, as I say, all the social skills. As I read your book, though, when he gets, he, his night on the rampage in Florida was horrible. Just the yes. numbers, please. The, the violence. He entered a, uh, the Chi Omega sorority house at Florida State University and went from room to room to room. He was convicted of bludgeoning three girls as they lay sleeping in their bed. Uh, he murdered two others, then, and this is an interesting recurrence or replay of the previous pattern, those crimes occurred uh, around uh, 2 o'clock or between midnight and 2 a.m. At 4.30 a.m. at a house three blocks away, a whole brand new strike, he entered that house and uh, attempted to kill a girl there. He did bludgeon her, beat her very badly. How was he caught? Uh, Police chase. He was finally caught trying, well, he was caught apparently exiting Florida a few weeks later. Now, he's in the death cell. Correct. They have, oh, first of all, 
Am I right in interpreting from your book that the evidence that convicted him in Florida might not have convicted him in Washington? That he got rough justice in Florida? I think that can be said. Uh, not that I'm complaining no, about I'm it. No, I'm not. No, I, I, we do have to look at it uh, rather, rather candidly, and I want to separate my own feelings from the thing. But I sat through a lot of court cases. I just finished a long one uh, down in Seattle here recently on a political case where you sit and you, you are serving really as a juror as you watch a case as a news, news reporter and you examine the evidence rather carefully and you want to be convinced beyond reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. Beyond reasonable doubt. The consensus of most re reporters and outsiders examining that Florida trial was that an awful lot of reasonable doubt had been raised during that trial. But the jury didn't waste any time. He was found guilty smack quickly on first the crimes we just discussed and then a second crime the murder of a little 12-year-old girl in northern Florida. In both cases, the jury came in fast. Um, Ted and his defense lawyers uh, were somewhat taken aback. They felt that they had raised reasonable doubt, and a lot of observers thought that. But the form of justice does vary from state to state within the United States. Yeah, most people would prefer the Florida type. I'm I, afraid nowadays. I, I have no comment on that. <laughs> I'm going to put my newsman's hat back on. All right, let me tell you one other question. Should he be executed? I doubt that Ted will ever be executed. Uh, he is one of approximately 145 or more men on death row in Florida. He and all the others have automatic appeals available to them. Mm -hmm. Ted's are yet to go forward. Uh, they'll take several years. And uh, if the automatic appeal is turned down, there are probably a multitude of others. I'm uh, not going to ask you appeal, an appeal. Opinion, but I think maybe the public is still vengeful on these kinds of killings. Yes. They? There's no question about it, um, and it's understandable. It's one thing to talk about someone you know, who might do, sitting on death row. And I know a lot of the good qualities about this man. I know my belief is that it would be a tragic waste to destroy all and, uh, and destroy also our opportunity to understand, to find out, unlock the secret of why it happens. But simultaneously, when you think about society and, and its protectiveness of young women and well, young males growing up, they're especially vulnerable, they're especially cherished, they're especially loved by their family and their acquaintances. To me, that's one of the most stark crimes of all, is just to uh, just deliberately pick out and extinguish that life. Richard Larson, author of The Deliberate Stranger. Will you go back and see Bundy? I hope to, yes. Don't give my regards. <laughs> okay. The deliberate stranger. After the break.